Thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you to the organizers for um, a inter very interesting meeting. I always like to, I'm not a philosopher, as some people have said, but uh, I like philosophy. I took a class in philosophy of science in college, and um, it almost made me quit physics. To go to philosophy or to...? Because of the philosophy, <laughs> not because I preferred philosophy, because the philosophy convinced me that I didn't know what the hell I was talking about in physics, which I guess was a good thing, but by the end of the class, I uh, finally, like, things came back into focus in a new way. Um, yeah, I had to write a term paper, and it was about Einstein's view of reality, but anyway, we can talk about that afterwards. <laughs> uh, also, I wanted to say, like Steve Carlo, if I had a connection with um, Cecile DeWitt. In fact, she was my supervisor at University of Texas, and um, I feel a connection with her coming here because of how involved she was with the Institute. And so I just want to remark on that. My talk today is a subject that I was asked to speak about. Um, so what can black holes teach us about quantum gravity? If I don't mean to imply that I will answer this in any definitive way at all, but I will share some thoughts about it. Oh, here. This thing... So that's the magic eight ball. When I was a kid, I had a magic eight ball. Does anybody know what that is? No. Yeah. Not here. Not in France? Not in France. Well, you know, an eight ball in pool table, it's the black ball with an eight on it. But this one was a little bigger, and um, you asked a question, you held it in your hand and you asked it questions. And uh, then to find the answer, you turn it over upside down. And there was a kind of um, tetrahedral piece that floated inside a fluid inside it, and it would float up to the top, and you'd see it through an obscure window. She has one. Oh. <laughs> so anyway, that, that's, it brought that to mind when I was thinking about what can black holes teach us about quantum gravity. Uh, here's the plan of the talk. Um, I hope I get to it. There are two things at a certain coarse grain level. Uh, I'll talk about black hole entropy and the main, well, m one of the main messages, it's not really about black holes. And then, uh, that part is all on the computer, and hopefully I'll get through that in a suitable time. And then I'll talk about the second point, which is a black hole information paradox. And I also would say it's also not really about black holes. Um, however, black holes point our noses in fruitful directions, and that's why we're talking about black holes. Oops. So I'll start with the famous thought experiment that got Bekenstein started on defining black hole entropy. If a cup of tea is dropped into a black hole, the entropy uh, in the cup disappears from the outside world. Bekenstein realized, well, something changes though, the black hole grows, and in particular, the area of the black hole grows. And this was shortly after Hawking had proved the area theorem in classical general relativity the area of an event horizon can never decrease, which was striking to everybody in its analogy with the second law of thermodynamics. So for that reason and others, Bekenstein proposed that the black hole actually has an entropy, um, which compensates the loss of entropy from the outside. And that was in 1972. In particular, he proposed the entropy is proportional to the area, since entropy is dimensionless, if we don't use Boltzmann's constant, we need to divide that area by something with dimensions of length squared in four dimensions of space-time. And so, presumably, I mean, you could simply by dimensional analysis guess that that must be the Planck length squared. However, he did much more, as I'll tell you in a moment. I mean, his reasoning was much deeper than that. Um, <laughs> In any case, for those that might not be familiar, the Planck length squared is h bar times Newton's constant divided by the speed of light cubed. It's a very tiny length squared, and so this is a, an enormous amount of entropy, far more than could have been, for instance, in the star that collapsed to form the black hole. By the way, this black hole is elliptical 
or uh, you know, oblate because it's spinning. <laughs> he also proposed the generalized second law. Uh, so that was the key idea. So even though the entropy outside, maybe I even have a pointer here, the outside entropy um, goes down because the cup of tea fell inside, something went up, in fact, by enough so that the total, the sum of the outside entropy and this black hole entropy, uh, in fact, went up. He, pro he proposed that law, as, and he called it the generalized second law, and he tested it in his paper uh, from 1972. And, um, well, let me first, before I talk about the test, just uh, talk a little bit about the reasoning he used to justify this that went far beyond dimensional analysis. Okay, the argument I'm going to give, it, it is the argument he gave, but it's using, it's like with the benefit of hindsight uh, version of the argument. So first of all, he knew he wanted to consider uh, something that was like thermodynamics, and he needed to relate the entropy change of the black hole to some energy change to apply the first law of thermodynamics. So he derived the first law of thermodynamics. He was actually the first person to do that, I think. And that's a relationship between, if you have, whoops, if you have a black hole of mass m, angular momentum j, and charge q, with a electrostatic potential phi at infinity, or the difference between infinity and the horizon, angular velocity of the horizon omega h, and an area of the horizon a, and a surface gravity of the horizon, this is not what he had, so, but some, some other function here, there's a relationship between the differentials of these quantities, which he just extracted by looking at the Kerr solution, the Kerr-Newman solution from general relativity, which is the rotating charge black hole. You could just vary those parameters and in, infer this formula. A much deeper version or derivation of this came shortly thereafter by Bardeen, Carter, and Hawking, uh, in which it was realized that, you know, how general it was and how it was really coming from diffeomorphism invariance and how the coefficient of the area term, the surface gravity, is an intensive quantity. So for Bekenstein, it was just a, a function of these parameters. But it's a, it's a locally defined quantity on the horizon. And moreover, on, a, on an oblate horizon like that, it's not necessarily constant because it's not a spherically symmetric object. Nevertheless, the surface gravity is a constant on the horizon of a black hole. And that's analogous to the zeroth law of thermodynamics which was realized after Bekenstein's derivation. Okay, so Bekenstein had this relation, but he didn't know that was surface gravity, it was just some parameter. And uh, his reasoning was uh, to interpret the left-hand side as the entropy change times the temperature, and then the right-hand side, according to the Clausius relation of thermodynamics, would be the heat flux into the black hole. So he's interpreting this combination as heat flux into the black hole. And Q is not Q. Q is not Q. Q. Oh, that's a different Q, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Whoops. Okay, so here's the... Um, Delta Q. That's true, yeah. <laughs> so, um, his, the most interesting thing about his entire derivation was the next step. He said, um, from an information theory point of view, entropy is a count of the logarithm of distinguishable states, or something like that, or information, missing information. So the smallest change that entropy could make, not in statistically speaking on average, but with a definite change of information, a certain change in information, would be logarithm of two. So he said there must therefore be a minimum amount of heat that could be added to the black hole. And if he could figure out what that minimum amount of heat was, then he could figure out um, what unit to measure area and to get entropy. So just forgetting the area term for a minute, just look at this equation. The minimum heat that can be added is just uh, T. Sorry, I read it, wrote it the other way. T 
is the minimum heat divided by log 2. So what is that minimum heat that can be added? So he reasoned that uh, if you try to lower, you know, you could make, why is there any minimum? That's the key question. You could just take an arbitrarily small mass and, and just uh, put it into the black hole. Uh, but an arbitrarily small mass has a large wavelength. And so if, if it's, you know, the wavelength is huge compared to the black hole, it wouldn't necessarily go in. And then he realized, well, actually, I don't even need a small mass. I could take any mass, but just lower it extremely close to the event horizon because of the gravitational redshift. Its energy measured at infinity, or its killing energy, would be arbitrarily small. The closer it is to the horizon, this is not falling in. It's a static mass being held above the horizon. The mass can be made arbitrarily small. So it looks like there is no minimum until we take into account quantum mechanics. Whoops, this was not, oh, I'm pushing the wrong thing. Until we take into account quantum mechanics. So here's the minimum uh, heat we can put in. Mu is just the mass of some particle we're gonna try to put in uh, as little of killing energy as possible. The size of the particle is B, some finite B. And uh, the killing energy is the norm of the killing field, chi, at whatever location the mass is at times the mass. And so we're looking for the minimum that this product can be. Now the norm of the killing field is zero on the horizon and near the horizon it grows linearly with proper distance. And the coefficient of that linear growth is the surface gravity. So chi is just kappa and the distance from the horizon, the minimum, is the size of the particle, b. So this just becomes kappa b mu min. But now B mu min is an energy, as a length times an energy. That's how, how small can I possibly make B for a given mass? Uh, the uncertainty relation tells me that could be no smaller than H bar. And therefore, the minimum value of that product is H bar, so the minimum heat that can be added is H bar kappa. And going back to here, that means that the temperature is of order H bar kappa, the surface gravity. And that was Bekenstein's argument. Although, like I said, he didn't know kappa was the surface gravity. That means that the minimum area change is actually h bar g, if you just follow this equation, and that's the Planck length squared. And therefore, finally, that the entropy is the area divided by h bar g, just read out of this equation. So he didn't just, you know, he derived that the um, unit of entropy, h bar g, is independent of the black hole mass, charge, and spin. It really is a property, it really is a justification that the area can be considered, well, is a good candidate for the role of entropy. I'll come back to that. Now, his generalized second law, he tested it with thought experiments, and um, he had a problematic experiment, actually, where it seemed to not satisfy the second law. And he, that was an experiment where the black hole is placed in a bath of radiation, where the radiation temperature is actually lower than this effective temperature of the black hole, h bar kappa. And if that happens still, though, because it's a black hole, radiation will go into the black hole, but nothing will come out. So heat will be flowing from a colder reservoir to a hotter one, violating the generalized second law. So it's strange that he managed to fool himself at this point that, it, that that was okay. He did note that at that very, at such a low temperature, the wavelength of the radiation is very long. In fact, uh, as much longer than the black hole size by something like a factor of 100. And uh, he said, therefore, this process of radiation going into the black hole is dominated by quantum fluctuations in the radiation bath. And so what, you know, but he concluded, so therefore it's okay somehow, the second law doesn't have to hold. It was really a strange um, lapse of reason given how clear the rest of the reasoning in the paper is. In any case, he fooled himself, and really the fact of the matter is, there's no way the generalized second law can hold unless the black hole actually radiates at this temperature. So he could have, in that paper, inferred the existence of Hawking radiation without calculating anything in quantum field theory.
So the Hawking temperature actually is not just h bar kappa roughly, it has a very specific coefficient, which is 1 over 2 pi. The, the input being gener the generalized second law. Pardon? The input being the generalized second law. Yes. In, in your convention, C is 1, I Yes, at this point. It wasn't a, a little bit earlier. <laughs> um, okay, and that means that the coefficient in the entropy is also very precise. It's one-fourth of the area divided by Planck length squared. We heard about this earlier. In fact, I should say, the talks that have come so far in the conference set up my talk perfectly because <laughs> all the ingredients have been explained. Um, so what's going on here? What is Hawking radiation? Uh, the thing that Jacob Beckenstein didn't consider is, even though he was thinking about fluctuations, is that a black hole sitting in vacuum is, is actually immersed in the vacuum of quantum fields. So it's never actually isolated. And in fact, the quantum vacuum is unstable in the presence of a black hole. And the radiation, the paradox of having something come out of a black hole, which is what was making him not introduce Hawking radiation, is solved by the fact that the Hawking radiation doesn't come out of the black hole. It's really a vacuum instability around the horizon. And the radiation we see, you could say, came from outside the horizon. And it's partnered with, it's correlated with quantum field fluctuations inside the horizon, uh, which fall in. Actually, they're trying to come out, but they fall backwards in. They're dragged in. Uh, so that's the nature of Hawking radiation, and the whole story fits together beautifully. Okay, so what is this black hole entropy? Um, what is it counting, and what is the source of this thermodynamic behavior of what started out as a theory of partial differential equations and supremely classical physics? The key, I claim or believe or assert or argue is that is to remember the key fact about general relativity which is that or about black holes in general relativity is that a horizon is not a special place in space-time uh, it's like any other place if you fall across the horizon you can't tell you're falling across it might be a small enough black hole that the curvature is fairly large there but it wouldn't be qualitatively different on the horizon than you know, a Schwarzschild radius away. So therefore, we may as well look for the answers to this deep question in flat space-time. Forget about black holes. So here's the story of black hole thermodynamics in flat space-time. Um, I'm going to just state a few facts, and then I'll explain them in the following. So first of all, um, Bekenstein's derivation actually applies not just to black hole entropy, but to acceleration horizon entropy. Uh, the origin of the Hawking radiation actually exists in flat space already, and it's known as the Unruh effect, which is that the, the vacuum of flat space time looks thermal when viewed in a restricted region. The Minkowski vacuum um, has an entanglement entropy the quantum fluctuations in the vacuum, which scale with the area and therefore provide a candidate for the states that the black hole entropy is counting. And now it gets uh, further. Um, what about this classical partial differential equation? Well, just from thermodynamic principles applied to this uh, restricted vacuum, it implies the necessity that the causal structure of space-time is actually dynamical. It is not rigid. And in fact, that the Einstein equation holds. And I'll just mention a little bit how that reasoning goes. And finally, all of this we're getting out of basically flat space-time reasoning. Newton's constant, which is going to appear in this Einstein equation that's derived this way, depends on the matter content in the universe. And it runs with energy. And in fact, it becomes large at short distances. So all of that is coming out of flat space-time. So to understand that, the key is this picture. It's to think about the symmetry of flat space-time and put that together with quantum field theory. So in Euclidean, this is just the Euclidean plane over here. Uh, it has translational and rotational 
symmetry about any center. So we can choose Cartesian coordinates to make the translation symmetry manifest or rotational or polar coordinates to make rotation symmetry manifest. And that's the flow of the rotational symmetry around a particular origin. In Minkowski space, um, also as we heard about, I guess, yesterday, uh, there are similar symmetries. There's translation in time and space, and there's hyperbolic rotation about any point. Here I'm just talking about two dimensions of Minkowski space, but uh, orthogonal to those two dimensions, we can have any number of space-like dimensions that don't play a role in what I'm saying. We could choose Cartesian-like coordinates or Minkowski coordinates to make the translation symmetries manifest, or we could choose polar coordinates, that is hyperbolic polar coordinates, to make the hyperbolic rotation symmetry manifest. And the, uh, just like here, R is the radius from the fixed point. Here, L is the proper uh, length from the fixed point over here. And uh, this coordinate patch, these coordinates cover just this triangle here. I think I'm going to add the triangle. Yeah, there we go. Um, eta is analogous to theta. It's the hyperbolic angle. And the flow of this symmetry is hyperbolas, whereas here we have circles. So the difference is that here the flow sends the entire space into itself, whereas here each of these four uh, wedges flows into itself under this hyperbolic symmetry. Now here's uh, when we add quantum field theory in, it turns out that Lorentz invariance and stability of the vacuum actually imply that the, the vacuum of a quantum field theory in Minkowski space is a thermal state. I mean, it's actually the zero energy eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, but that's the Hamiltonian that generates time translations in space-time. But if we restrict to observations inside this right-hand wedge region, it's called the Rindler wedge, then the vacuum state, which is pure, appears as a mixed state because of those uh, correlations in vacuum fluctuations on either side of this point, or really of this plane, because we have other dimensions orthogonal to that. So we take the vacuum, the ground state of the Hamil translation Hamiltonian uh, zero, form the projector, trace over the field degrees of freedom on the left-hand side, we get a density matrix. And that density matrix, in fact, has the form of a thermal state where the Hamiltonian is just the generator of this uh, hyperbolic rotation symmetry, which is called the boost Hamiltonian. And the temperature is h bar divided by 2 pi, which you might remember seeing in the Hawking temperature formula. There it was h bar over 2 pi times the surface gravity. This was actually derived by, by uh, axiomatic quantum field theory people, Bisignano and Vickman, in the same year, basically, as Davies and also Unruh came upon it from a very different physics viewpoint. And this, so this is once again saying that the vacuum looks thermal at this temperature. Um, I should say that temperature doesn't, h bar over 2 pi has dimensions of action, not <coughs> energy. So how can it be temperature? But temperature in the sense that it's conjugate to this Hamiltonian, and this Hamiltonian doesn't have dimensions of energy either. It has dimensions of action because it's like an angular momentum generating this hyperbolic rotation rather than being an energy. Nevertheless, if we pick a particular observer in this wedge, say following this hyper hyperbola, and if that observer makes observations localized at their world line, well then they wouldn't want to use the hyperbolic angle as their time coordinate. They'd use their proper time. And if I scale um, to the proper time of this observer, that depends on the acceleration of that observer, which actually is the reciprocal of the, uh, of the distance, the proper distance of that observer to the horizon. So that local observer measures the temperature h bar times the acceleration over 2 pi, and that's the unruh temperature, which is also h bar over 2 pi l, l being that radial distance. So note that uh, the acceleration of that hyperbola diverges as, as L goes to zero, as the hyperbola gets closer to the light cone. 
Um, and that means that, you know, there's a lot of, you can think about that as quantifying the amount of entropy in this thermal state. It's like if you're in a thermal bath whose temperature is infinite, that's an awful lot of entropy. And we can estimate actually how much entropy in the following way. The, entropy, the von Neumann entropy in the right-hand wedge is minus trace of the right-hand density matrix times its log. Now let's just uh, treat that roughly like a thermal bath with a temperature T local, where T local is the temperature I just mentioned here. Oops, sorry. Uh, the key thing is its dependence on 1 over L. So I'm going to integrate the entropy density T cubed over volume. The volume has a transverse area and a proper distance from the uh, origin there. T depends reciprocally on L, so we have 1 over L cubed DL. And if we integrate that, we get 1 over L squared. And at the lower limit of integration, L is 0, so 1 over L squared is infinite. But if we cut it off at some finite epsilon, we'll get 1 over epsilon squared. So this tells us that the entanglement entropy in the vacuum goes like the area divided by some cutoff epsilon, which I'm just putting in by hand at this stage. And this is what I was claiming as a candidate for the origin of black hole entropy. Any questions so far, actually? So the hypothesis that this really is, uh, that black hole entropy is entanglement entropy, has actually been supported by all kinds of calculations. Um, for example, involving free fields with various types of regulators, you know, playing the role of that epsilon. Also, what was mentioned earlier, uh, the Ryutaki Anagi formula in ADS CFT context, which has nothing to do with black holes, but it equates the entanglement entropy in a conformal field theory in the, in the boundary, <coughs> conformal quantum field theory, to the area of the minimal surface that hangs down from that into the bulk divided by 4G. It's not 100% clear, I mean, this is a, that this is correct because of course it's really infinite in the theory that we have in our hands and it, the actual precise result depends on the cutoff and the way we make it. And also, in fact, uh, it depends on unresolved issues on how to precisely define entanglement entropy when you have fields with gauge symmetry or diffeomorphism, especially with diffeomorphism symmetry. Uh, I just mentioned here also that in order to fully agree with black hole entropy, you have to include corrections beyond the area term, but I, sh I shouldn't get into that right now. So, um, this reminds me of the article of Thibault's that I read just before coming here about Poincaré and Lorentz and Einstein, the origin of special relativity. Back in those days, uh, Lorentz and Poincaré were all concerned with constructing a physical model of a divergent thing, which was an electron which they would have liked, I guess, to be a point, except that would have infinite self-energy, so it had to have a size, but then because it had to have a size, it had to have mechanical properties that held it together, and then they tried to calculate how it deforms under boosts and all of that. And it was a difficult program, and I mean, Poincaré's model that Thibault talked about in there that was the grand success, I guess, the best formulation of the problem, was, after all, just some artificial model that he invented. And in, t in the end, what did we learn? It's all ir irrelevant. Einstein made the right move to just cut through the whole thing and just say, forget about that model. Just clearly this symmetry has to be there, this symmetry being Lorentz symmetry. In fact, let's make it a fundamental principle and build the physics anew on top of it, and we'll deal with that electron structure, you know, down the road. Get up. 
Yeah, I solved it. Solved it in a way, but it still has infinite self energy. <laughs> it still has infinite self energy. I mean, so certain problems you shouldn't solve at certain times in physics. <laughs> and I guess I feel like, the reason I brought it up is I sort of feel like this is an example of that. It's obvious, I would claim, that black hole entropy is entanglement entropy. But, but it precisely in what sense, in terms of what quantities and how to resolve these ambiguities, we are not in a position really to answer today. But, uh, Ted, uh, you're aware of the work of Sergei Solodurin, who showed what you are going to discuss next, that actually this infinite part computably is equal to the renormalization of G due to the fields you include. So from this point of view, it's precisely not the part of the answer you want. It's just a consistency check. Yeah, I don't see it that way. Okay. <laughs> but to me, it um, meant that it was not entangled entropy. Sorry, it was not what? That the black hole entropy is yeah. not entangled. So, right, so I'll make exactly the opposite change. argument yes. right now. <laughs> so are, are you also going to comment on the strominger bothwick counting of Yeah, okay. went down the road. Um, Everything is down the road, like Einstein told us. No, no, I'm within this talk. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so how, how, so if there's this entanglement entropy out there, and Bekenstein told us, remember, we should, the generalized entropy is black hole entropy plus the entropy outside. Now, this entanglement entropy is entropy outside. So I should include it, I guess, in the outside term. And yet, if I take the cutoff to the epsilon down to the Planck length, the outside entropy is now just as big as the black hole entropy is. So, and moreover, so how should I deal with that? So here's what I, what I believe is how we should think about it and deal with it. Uh, the entanglement, the question is, how is this entanglement entropy apportioned between, in the generalized entropy, between the outside entropy term and the black hole entropy term? So here's the total entropy. If I impose a cutoff epsilon, I get an outside entropy. And then I have the remaining, the black hole entropy, but now, in order for the um, story to be consistent, that is, I should be able to move that cutoff and count more or less of the uh, entanglement entropy as outside entropy, then that must mean that Newton's constant, because that's the only thing that can vary on this side of the equation, is also epsilon dependent and varies in just the right way that the sum of those two is invariant under a shift of epsilon or in other words, in a renormalization group invariant sum, but not separate terms. And that's actually been shown, again, in, in, in certain contexts where the ambiguities can be dodged and it se things seem well-defined. There are quite a number of what I find very convincing arguments that this is the right way to interpret this. If it is, then of course we could think about two limits. We could take epsilon uh, going to infinity that means that the short distance cutoff is very long, basically. So there's virtually no entanglement entropy to talk about. All of the entropy is in this term. And that's the limit epsilon to infinity. That corresponds to G being equal to Newton's constant, what we mean by Newton's constant. And it's all, it's all uh, black hole entropy. It's all bekenstein hawking entropy. If we take the other limit, where epsilon goes to zero, the entropy shifts from this term to this term. And I would say it becomes all entanglement entropy. But in one case, we have a microscopic explanation of what it is and why it's there. In the other case, it's a total mystery. So I, I personally draw the conclusion from this that black hole entropy is entanglement entropy of the vacuum. It's just that we don't have a complete handle on what that means today. By the way, infinity, is it? Plus infinity for bosons, minus infinity for fermions, so it's always plus infinity. It's always plus infinity. But there is a sign issue, like for um, gauge fields, which there's an interesting story that's been, I would say, largely resolved recently by Donnelly and Wall. But we should, that's a very technical thing. Um, okay, but, but is this vacuum entanglement entropy how could this possibly be true? Because the amount of entanglement entropy depends on 
how many quantum fields are in the theory. Right? If I have three families in the standard model, I have more entropy than if I have one. But the only way that could be true is if Newton's constant also depends on the number of fields in the theory. And uh, why should Newton's constant always be matching perfectly what it has to be for this formula to be true? So here's my uh, proposed understanding of the answer to that, which is to basically infer that the Einstein equation and the equality of Newton's constant with kind of the reciprocal of the entropy divided by the area is that the Einstein equation is the equation of state of the vacuum fluctuations. So again, the vacuum is a pure state. There's nothing thermodynamic to think about. But if we restrict our view of it to a wedge, it becomes a subsystem and it's got lots of degrees of freedom and it's all mixed up and so that's a context where thermodynamics should apply and I applied it. This is from way, a paper a long time ago. So just thinking about, and I, I don't want to get deep into the argument, I would just state the ingredient pieces and the conclusion. Defining a local causal horizons uh, analogous to black hole horizons, considering uh, the local Minkowski space structure, defining heat flux as the amount of boost energy flowing across the horizon, and demanding the Clausius relation holds, assuming also that the horizon area A, with some coefficient I don't know, gives the entropy, and demanding the Clausius relation, dS is dQ over T, what is that going to imply? Well, first of all, it implies that the area must change if there's a non-zero heat flux. But how can the area of a causal horizon change when a causal horizon is just defined by the trajectories of uh, null geodesics? So it means there must be focusing of null geodesics in space-time, which is, which is the statement that there's curvature in space-time. So space-time must be curved the causal structure must change in a, respond, in a way that responds to the flux of boost energy. Boost energy can be constructed from the energy momentum tensor. So this is going to give a relation between the area change and the energy momentum tensor. And in fact, using the Ray Chaudhuri equation of uh, geodesic deviation, it actually implies that the if I assume that it holds on all possible horizons, pointing in all different directions at every point in space-time, this, this set of assumptions implies the Einstein equation with some value of Newton's constant. And that value is determined by this coefficient alpha. Whatever it is, you get a Newton's constant that's 1 over 4 h bar alpha. Oh, I should say, and I'm assuming the temperature here is the temperature I just mentioned, the unroot temperature of the vacuum. Can I make a small comment? Mm -hmm. well, this is a spectacular calculation. I think everybody will recognize a spectacular calculation. I've been, I've been long um, puzzled what, where, where is the key input. And I, I just want to make one point. The first equation, A, S equal alpha A uh, with some alpha, seems very innocuous uh, because one is tempted to say, well, it's true in most short range, I don't know, um, entangled entropies across. And, uh, but if you look for a you know, condensed matter physics, uh, you have something like that, but alpha depends on the state, it's not universal. So the, 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 the strong input is the non-dependence of alpha on the state here. So I think you would agree with that. No? That's a good not point. To say um, anything. That's what we, because we, we try to, to see why it doesn't happen for other systems, so we try to go through and, and any other system has an alpha that depends on the state. So this is a, a strong input here. Yeah, so the reasoning that I was, so the, the, the justification such as it is would be that um, the vacuum at short distances is universal in any state. It has the same structure. Of course, that's not really true because you could have phase transitions in the vacuum or something. And actually you could have renormalizations of Newton's constant that feed into the formula. But putting that aside, it's the universality of the structure of the vacuum independent of the state that motivates this, to, yes. this to be a constant. Exactly. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so that, so let's see what conclusions we draw from this whole story, or we could draw, or might draw. 
So it seems to follow that black hole entropy includes and may be 100% vacuum entanglement entropy. Secondly, if, we, if the entanglement entropy had been infinite, so if I had no cutoff, then Newton's constant would be zero. That is, I wouldn't have any gravity. Because the, going back to the equation, uh, whoops, the variation, so in order to match a finite dq, if, area, if, if alpha is infinite, the area variation has to be zero. Or putting it differently, I solve for g and it goes like one over alpha. If alpha were infinite, g would be zero. And this is crucial because otherwise we'd be convincing ourselves that it's impossible to write down a quantum field theory that has no gravity in it which is obviously not true. Um, it's just that it's the finiteness of the entropy that forces gravity on us. Okay. Conversely, what is it that's making this cutoff? Since gravity is a consequence of the entropy being finite, it stands to reason that gravity should be responsible for making the entropy finite. Somehow there should be a link between the finiteness and the existence of gravity going in the other direction. And there is an argument you can make from the gravitational dressing of the vacuum fluctuations that they would be cut off uh, when, the, when the separation of the uh, fluctuation on either side of the horizon of that pair is shorter than the Planck length. And I made that argument in this paper. It's a, it's a very hand-wavy argument, but I think it has a nugget of truth in it. Uh, the Newton's constant depends on the number and species of matter fields, and there's no species problem uh, that is problem with this story coming from the, the fact that the entanglement entropy depends on the number of species. Also, actually, this I gave a thermodynamic derivation here of the Einstein equation, but recently um, I approached this a different way and gave a statistical derivation, um, not based on the Clausius relation, but based on a principle that the vacuum entanglement is maximal because the vacuum is somehow an equilibrium state of entanglement. And this applies in a small geodesic balls uh, at fixed spatial volume. So it's not a story about evolving horizons. It's just a story about comparing the entanglement entropy in a small ball in the vacuum state to the entanglement entropy in a small ball in some other state. And let me just say one word about this. You might think, okay, this, this is nuts. How can, I mean, here's a ball in the vacuum, okay? Clearly, I can just take a an entangled pair of qubits and put one inside the ball and you know increase the entropy by log two. But the thing is if I do that, that bit has some energy and that energy sources gravity and the gravity makes the area of the ball shrink at fixed volume. And it shrinks by enough that actually the total entropy goes down, not up. So that's the principle of that argument. What is fixed volume the right thing to consider? Uh, that is a good question. And I, um, I recently, talking to, um, by email with Mati Rasaka, I don't know if you know that guy, he's a Finnish, young Finnish physicist, had an interesting thought about the possible answer to that, which is that if you look at the, um, so if you imagine there's some discrete structure underlying this, you might think that the size of the algebra of quantum fields inside the ball is determined by the spatial volume because the ball, because of the ball, because extensivity of the quantum field algebra, something like that. And so, I mean, obviously, if you enlarge the algebra, then you could have more entropy. It's like you know, the entropy of a gas in a box is not maximal in equilibrium if you allow yourself to make the box bigger. So somehow you should fix the number of 
possible states you're even talking about before you compare the entropy. That's the best I can do. It's very hand-waving. Yeah, just in the argument, I just assumed it because I noticed that if I assumed it, it worked. Uh, okay, and then, um, yeah, I just want to emphasize also, what, what should we conclude from this? Is the Einstein equation thermodynamics, is gravity, you know, different from all other quantum fields? Should we not quantize gravity? All that kind of question arises. I think the answer is no. Uh, it's not really different. We know that we can apply, in fact, this hasn't been said yet in this meeting, but it really should be emphasized. You know, quantum gravity is a big mystery in many ways, but in one way it's not a mystery at all. We can simply apply quantization to it as an effective field theory, like we would with any quantum field theory. It won't be well defined at energy scales up at the Planck scale, and its predictions will only be precise up to ambiguities of order the reciprocal of energy scale you're probing to the Planck scale. But still, it's a perfect, other than that, which is actually the case for many quantum field theories we use, it's a perfectly well-defined quantum field theory. And I don't think any of this implies that that doesn't hold for gravity. On the other hand, um, it does seem that if we were to probe, this is saying that if we were to probe the dynamics of space-time at the Planck scale, we shouldn't expect necessarily a conservative theory like a field theory would be. Maybe it should be more like a dissipative phenomenon because, after all, uh, the, this regularity of the causal structure is emerging from some statistical property of the vacuum. So I would say it seems to, it seems that dissipative effects should be expected at the Planck scale. By the way, Fed, as people like motos, uh, like ER equal EPR, did you use here as a motto EE, -E, Einstein equation equal entanglement entropy, EE -E equal EE? -E? No, <laughs> but... Equal entanglement equilibrium equal EE -E again. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> <laughs> now, another question. Species problem. In string theory, there is an infinite spectrum of particles. Yeah. Is it a problem for this? That's why I thought there are signs for high spin. I mean, there are signs with high spins at least. No? The, the, the contribution to the renormalization of G depends on the spin if it does not depend on, I mean, maybe not fermions, but there are minus signs. In same theory, Your gauge maybe. fields have minus signs, but like I said, there's a story behind that where you have to get into the um, edge mode entropy of gauge fields that hadn't been accounted for in the heat kernel method. And but in fact, it's infinite, positive. If you have a theory with an infinite number of particles. Yeah. Like All I, yeah, I haven't studied closely, but people have looked at like the, um, the, entangle, the entanglement entropy in string theory. And I don't think there's a kind, maybe it's the, the fact that the masses of the component fields are getting Planckian takes care of it? I, I don't know. It should be, yeah, I agree that it's a question. But I don't agree that it's a problem necessarily. Could I ask about the, the dissipative? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I mean, if we agree that general relativity is an effective theory, then it would seem like the conclusion at the Planck scale is that that theory breaks down, and we're just going to need some other more fundamental description mm -hmm. of physics at the Planck scale. Right. So, so why are you claiming that physics at the Planck scale you know will be dissipative rather than just physics of some other degrees of freedom? Well, see, I feel like I would be ignoring the lesson that I've learned from the story I told so far if I just said, well, at the Planck scale it breaks down, so something takes over. So what should take over? Based, if I hadn't done, learned what I've just described, I guess I would have thought, you know, some unified field theory that, I don't know, string theory or something. But, uh, <laughs> but the thing is, it seems like what we're being shown is that there's something, there is something statistical about the vacuum, and it's really the dynamics of this complicated vacuum that is giving rise to gravity as we know it. So in past experience when we had large-scale regularities that came from an underlying complex statistical phenomenon, there is dissipation. You know, it, it's, not, it's not another theory of the kind we know 
at the large scale, it's a very different thing at the small scale. So that's the only, that's the reasoning I'm thinking of. Anyway, now I get to the question Gary asked about before. What about microstate counting? Um, and I'll talk about just very briefly in string theory and in loop quantum gravity. Um, to decide how much depth to go into here, I guess I'd like a time reading if that's possible. Maybe 20 minutes. Pardon? I would say about 20 minutes more. Okay, great. Because I think this is my last slide on this part and the, uh, before I get to the information, which I can make in a very contracted way. My point I want to make on the information uh, paradox, I think it can be made briefly. Okay, so we have this fantastic counting of black hole microstates in string theory, which we already heard a little bit about. Here's what I would say, and so the question you could say is, where, where do I come from proposing that black hole entropy really corresponds to these, this vacuum entanglement? We have a very different story that accounts for it in string theory. It, um, what is that story? So it doesn't count black hole states, that's the first statement. The string theory story is it counts string states on D brains at weak string coupling. So there's no black hole, it's a flat space configuration of a stack of D brains with strings on. So how is that a calculation of black hole microstates? Well, it's a trick. It uses supersymmetry to link this calculation that I just described to a different number, which is the number of states you would have had at strong coupling. So supersymmetry apparently is this magic symmetry that has the property that you can change a coupling constant from weak to strong. So much, so much change that a stack of deep brains in flat space becomes a black hole at strong coupling. But you know, based on the principle of the supersymmetry, that the number of states at a fixed values of the charges doesn't change. Therefore, the, the number is calculated where it's easy to calculate it, well, relatively easy to calculate it, as string states on D-brains, but that's also, one knows, equal to the number at strong coupling where you have a black hole. Note that in this calculation, Newton's constant is not renormalized. So Newton's constant in string theory comes out of, as Gary told us, the uh, string coupling constant and the string length. And under this supersymmetry um, setting, the, the long distance low energy Newton constant is the same in the strong coupling theory as in the weak coupling. So one can actually calculate the actual numerical coefficient of the Bekenstein Hawking entropy in terms of four times Newton's constant in the denominator and be you know, precise about the coefficient. So the result of this ultraviolet microstate counting can match the Bekenstein Hawking entropy perfectly. This doesn't logically mean, of course, that string theory is the right theory of quantum gravity. What it means is something like, first of all, this argument using supersymmetry that sounds very slick really seems to be correct. It also means that the effective field theory we extract at low energy from the string theory you know, will be, it's consistent with the, with the fact that we could have calculated the black hole entropy from the, from the low energy side and it better match. So this shows that string theory is not bullshit in a word. <laughs> but it doesn't show that string theory is quantum gravity in our world. Okay. Now another state counting that exists is in loop quantum gravity. In this case, it's, I would say it does count black hole states identified to the extent that we know how to identify them so far plausibly in loop quantum gravity. What they are is actually a, a kind of spin network. Uh, this is a discrete model of space in loop quantum gravity. And um, in fact, the result of this counting is re directly related to a kind of entanglement entropy and it scales with the area. Um, but uh, unlike the string calculation, it's not, it doesn't give a sharp answer for the coefficient. Because first of all, it depends on a free parameter in the theory that's not known yet how to pin down, called the emergency parameter. And because Newton's constant, unlike in this supersymmetric case, 
The Newton's constant that's used in the calculation is the microscopic one at the, at the cutoff scale of the theory that's not the low energy effective Newton constant. So that's a, a second reason why it can't be compared. Actually, I think there may be a problem with this. I argued in this paper, which has gotten incredibly little attention. <laughs> but I, if the result of this calculation gives the same answer for a black hole in, this, in pure gravity as it does in a black hole coupled to Maxwell field, uh, gravity coupled to Maxwell field. And that's usually described as a great success of this, but I actually think it's a problem because uh, the running of Newton's constant is different if you have a Maxwell field than if you don't. And therefore, in order for this calculation to actually be agreeing quantitatively with the Beck and Steen Hawking entropy in both theories, it seems in, in, in both, both with and without a Maxwell field seems incompatible. So I'm not strongly arguing that there's a problem, but it, it, it looks like a problem to me. Okay, so that's it for that part, and if you want me to stop, I can. But I could also... Yeah, yeah, we have... To 11. Yeah, yeah, we have plenty of time. We do? Okay, great. So what we want to do is turn this off and use the boards now, actually. Ah, um, okay. Let's see, should I just close? And I have some notes. Is this done by hand? Yes. There are three. There are many of them. Just on the choice. Oh. Oh, yeah, great. Thank you. Let me just catch my breath for a second. I feel like I'm unloading on you all of my strongly <laughs> opinionated um, beliefs. Okay, so that was a story of how black hole entropy isn't really about black holes. It's about the vacuum in any space-time. And now I want to make the case that the black hole information paradox is not about black holes either. And what do I mean by that? So first I should say that I believe for about three decades that there was no information paradox because um, inside a black hole there's a piece of space-time cut off from the outside. There's a singularity where curvature becomes infinite and we're not sure what happens. So, so what if information falls in there and becomes lost to the outside? Maybe there's a baby universe where the information goes. But um, in ADS-CFT, as been mentioned several times so far in, in the meeting, there's a very strong argument that at least in that setting, and I'm very happy to just consider that setting as a test case, uh, the Conformal field theory is unitary, and it is dual to at least a lot of what's going on in the space-time, including the possibility of forming and evaporating a black hole. So, it looks like black hole formation and evaporation must be unitary, at least in that setting. And so that was when I began to change my mind. And uh, there's another argument that connects this to just general relativity's fundamental principle, which is general covariance. This argument came from Don Maroff, and it introduces the notion of boundary unitarity. He made a, a, an argument that on account of diffeomorphism invariance, the Hamiltonian for gravity plus any matter in the theory um, is strictly a boundary term. In fact, the Hamiltonian is a combination of constraints and a boundary term, but the constraints are zero by the constraint equation in order to satisfy diffeomorphism invariance. If we're acting on a quantum state, the fact that the constraint is zero is the statement that the Wheeler-DeWitt equation holds. So to evolve a quantum state, we would apply the Hamiltonian whose only non-zero action is at infinity at the boundary. 
And then Merrill says, okay, let me consider all, besides, so one thing I could measure at the boundary is the total energy of the space-time. That's the value of the Hamiltonian. Let's say I could imagine, I could measure other things there as well. And in the anti-de Sitter setting, what's nice about the boundary is it's, it seems like there are more observables that you can get your hands on at the boundary of space-time. And Gary drew the picture of this cylindrical space-time So this is the bulk boundary. And we should just think about observers who live at the boundary and observe whatever can be observed from the boundary. And what Maroff pointed out is that those observ any observable in quantum mechanics evolves by Heisenberg equation of motion by a commutator with the Hamiltonian. The observables you can observe at the boundary define an algebra, and one element of that algebra is the Hamiltonian, and therefore that algebra evolves into itself under time evolution, and therefore any information you could have by measuring elements of that algebra at one time evolves unitarily into information you could have at any other time in the boundary. So in a nutshell, that's his argument. It's very slick. Well, why should we, a, a single time slice of the boundary be a cushy surface for the illusion? And can, can there be illusion to come from inside? Can't there be? Yeah. The Hamiltonian for general relativity is a, a boundary term at infinity. The Hamiltonian, but not the set of data. The full algebra on which it is. It is. Uh, it is. Uh, think about the classical theory. Yeah. In the classical. Theory, I think it's, it's different theory. classically and quantum mechanically. Why? The question is why. What is different here? I mean, because in the classical theory also you can do. Uh, uh, you can set up initial data. Yeah. But you cannot do just on the boundary. You need uh, you. You have free data on the boundary, right? Which is uh, the. Henry's uh, Newman uh, news function. They're not determined at a later time in the boundary if they're fixed at earlier time in the boundary. So what, this is this? exactly the argument that, um, so at a, at a meeting last year, Steve and Bob Wald and Aaron Wall and I started um, a quadrilogue, I guess you call it, <laughs> so, so <laughs> trying to resolve this question. Yeah, so definitely um, the classical theory doesn't have this property because there is initial data which doesn't register, let's say, at the boundary on this slice, but could come affect the boundary later. Yeah, so I think uh, Steve can probably help me explain this. Um, first of all, imagine that the spectrum, just for a moment, and I don't think the result really depends on this, but suppose the spectrum of the Hamiltonian were uh, non-degenerate, quantum mechanically, then you could measure the state from the boundary uniquely. No, no, but that's actually, that show, but this shows you couldn't make the same statement in classical mechanics. So what's different is the role the Hamiltonian plays in the theory, and the information it contains is different in the two theories. But let's not get hung up on this now. We could discuss it later. Otherwise, I'd never get to my basic. <coughs> I just I reported to you the way that Merrill made the case. I found it to be striking because it just uses diffeomorphism invariance. It doesn't invoke string theory or ADS CFT. And at the same time, it both um, kind of explains to me partly why ADS CFT, something like that, should even be possible. And at the same time, it gives an independent argument why black hole uh, formation and evaporation might be unitary. And he called this property boundary unitarity, just to emphasize that it's a statement about the boundary observables only. There might be observables in the bulk, as I think Gary mentioned in his talk, like we might have a space time without a boundary. And surely that has some observable somehow, if we understand quantum gravity. And probably then also 
in general, you could have a situation like this with a bulk observables that are not in the boundary algebra. But that's also irrelevant to the discussion at the moment, because all we're talking about is whether information is lost at the boundary. Because that seems to be the only sharp statement that I have a strong reason to believe in unitarity-wise. And, it, and it's traceable directly to diffeomorphism invariance. Okay, so that's the starting point. Now, we get a paradox, why? So, so uh, is there anything special to ADS in this picture, uh, just as having a boundary? So because it looks like this reasoning is applying to any space-time. Yeah, he, Merrill did argue that it applied in Minkowski space also, but it's a trickier argument, and it actually is more of an S-matrix-like argument, because the boundary isn't time-like there. We have two null pieces, scry minus and scry plus. So he made the, an argument that the evolution from scry minus to scry plus is unitary. But here, we, since it's time-like, we actually have a story, and we have an argument that, it's, that unitarity holds continuously as a function of boundary time. So it's, and as I mentioned earlier, we have more, because of ADS-CFT, we see that there's all these boundary observables that we could get a handle on here that we wouldn't know how to deal with in asymptotically flat space-time, at least yet. Okay, so what about the paradox then? So the paradox comes because we might uh, form a black hole by, say, sending a pulse of start with the vacuum, inject energy into the space-time, have it collapse and form a black hole. Uh, the horizon comes out like this. There's a singularity, whatever that is, how it's resolved. Hawking radiation starts to happen. And some of that Hawking radiation reaches the boundary. And on the other hand, this pair of a Hawking quantum and its correlated partner, remember that came from vacuum, just the structure of the vacuum locally here near the horizon. So this Hawking quantum state is entangled with its partner state. By the way, what's never talked about is what degree of freedom is entangled with, is involved in this entanglement. And the answer is the occupation number of the mode. Basically, so a given pair corresponds to some given frequency and say spherical harmonic labels or whatever. It's a mode, and that mode could be occupied at different levels. And the state is a superposition of a product of this at a certain occupation number and this at the same occupation number. Okay, so it's entangled, and that means that when it reaches the boundary, let's say here, well, maybe I'll look at the first one. So this quantum arrives at the boundary. My boundary observer can observe it, sees it to be in a mixed state, it's, it's, because it's entangled with this partner behind the horizon. So it looks like uh, the quantum state measured at the boundary would now no longer be a pure state, even though we may have started initially with a pure state. And this is basically the problem. We can't, you can't be in, a, a qubit cannot be entangled at the same time with two different qubits. Well, not yet, because so far you don't need a black hole for that. Just pair creation, one goes here, one is Yeah, this is the point I'm about to make. Oh, okay, sorry. No, well, here I'm talking about black hole evaporation now. So this qubit is entangled with that one. So it can't also be entangled with something else out here, the argument would go. And therefore, the state out here must have gone from a pure state to a mixed state, but that's incompatible with boundary unitarity. So there's a paradox. The firewall proposal was basically saying, OK, the conclusion is it must not be true, after all, that this qubit is entangled with this qubit. And therefore, uh, but that means the state here is not really the vacuum state, because if it's the vacuum, they are entangled. The, the firewall people didn't require the firewall right away with the first 
particle. They only right. We're going to get to that. Uh, yeah. Appear later. And they should have required it right away. This is one of my key points. In fact, let me make it right now. The firewall people, so I think the argument is being made completely incorrectly. They're trying to solve the wrong problem. So the problem they were trying to solve is trying to show that the relation between the initial state before the black hole forms and the final state after it's completely evaporated are related by unitary transformation. So in particular, all the Hawking radiation is now in a pure state finally at the end. What I would like to emphasize is that the first Hawking quantum comes out, we already have a problem with boundary unitarity. We shouldn't be trying to just show, and this is where anti de Sitter space is very useful as opposed to considering flat space time, because it's much more than the statement that the in-state is related to the out-state by unitary. It's continuously, the boundary algebra is continuously evolving unitarily. That's true in the CFT, and it's true according to Merrill's argument. So we should be worried, from the time the first talking quantum reaches the boundary, we should be worried. We have a paradox already, and therefore, in any case, you're right, what they, they weren't worried about that, but they said once it's halfway evaporated, if you still haven't, if the Hawking quanta has still haven't become purified by their correlations with each other, you had better interrupt this process in time for the Hawking quanta that come out to purify the early ones, because you can't purify a million things with 10 things, 10 qubits. You can't purify a million maximally mixed qubits with 10 other qubits. So halfway through at the so-called page time, they said it had better be that there's no more of this entanglement at the horizon. But if there's no entanglement, that means the state is not the vacuum state there. And so what is it? It's some very singular state of quantum fields called the firewall. But uh, like I just said a moment ago, I think they should have been worried at the first step. And so um, let's worry about the first step. Now I still haven't made the case, although I think Carlo just anticipated it a second ago, that the real problem here has nothing to do with black holes. Let me make another diagram where I don't make a black hole. I send uh, something in from the boundary and I just arrange for the following process to happen. It, it, some kind of collision happens and, uh, and a pulse comes out to the boundary. But that's not all. It also has a, some kind of a resonance. Part of the energy goes on like this, and it lives for some amount of time. I don't know how much doesn't really matter. And then it finishes decaying and the pulse goes out to the boundary. And it's easy to, you know, we always have, this could be like a, what's it called? Parametric down conversion of an atom where you get correlated photons coming out of it. This is like the first one, this is the second one. So these two can be entangled with each other. We start with a pure state of this shell coming in and it goes through this process and this outgoing shell or quantum or whatever it is, is entangled with that one. Now let's look at that from the viewpoint of the boundary observer. So when the first shell reaches the boundary at this time slice, it's in a mixed state because it's entangled with this resonance, or it's entangled with this if I had made this shorter. Therefore, just like here, I had a problem with boundary unitarity. It seems like I have a problem here with it. Of course, if I wait long enough, the entangled partner gets there, and finally it's no problem in this case, maybe unlike in the black hole case, it's clear that from the in-state to the out-state, I would have a unitary evolution. But that's not all we should be worrying about. What happens at this time slice? This is entangled with this, but somehow the boundary algebra is still evolving unitarily. 
So I believe that if we solve this problem, we have solved this problem, and it's not really a problem about black holes. So how could we possibly solve this problem? What are we missing? Because it's clearly a huge problem. It's, yeah? I don't know if I should wait for you to finish or, or object now, but I, I do object. Um, I don't think this is a problem, the, the, the example on the right, um, at least in the context of gauge gravity duality, because the gauge theory is supposed to be equivalent to everything in the bulk. Um, a particle sitting at the center of ADS is described by some operator in the dual gauge theory. It doesn't have to, doesn't describe only things which make it out to infinity. If the particle comes out to infinity, it's described by a local operator. A local Wait, but so Gary, everything you're saying would also apply to this picture. Um, um, yes, but here you have the added complication of, of having a horizon uh, and describing things inside the horizon, which we don't know uh, as well how to do. But that doesn't mean that your logic should become mushy at this point. Um, <laughs> I, you know, the question is not whether it's unitary at each stage. I think everybody would agree that black hole formation and evaporation corresponds to a state on the boundary which is uh, a pure state at every moment of time. Um, what we're trying to understand is how in detail that you know, happens. But I'm telling you, I think you're trying to understand the wrong thing. You're missing the right way to formulate this problem. You see... But I don't see a problem on the right. I'm you have exactly the same problem that you have here. Let me explain it. So what was the problem here? It was the monogamy of entanglement. So here, an observer could have fallen into this space-time, observed that this pair is entangled with each other, and yet, uh, we believe that the observer at the boundary, all of their observables evolve unitarily, despite the fact that this quantum arrives in a mixed state. No, no, no. The, the particle that falls in is also described on the boundary. That's well, but if that's the solution, then there's no problem. You see, the problem is, the problem is to reconcile local quantum field theory from the viewpoint of a bulk observer with boundary unitarity. Of course we know, especially if we believe in ADS-CFT, which I'm willing to, to do at least provisionally, of course we know the boundary evolution is exactly unitary. The paradox is to, re is to reconcile that with the fact that the bulk observer can apply local quantum field theory at large distance scales and sees entanglement. Now that paradox applies exactly the same way here as it applies here. So I believe that you are, uh, you and, and the entire community is focusing on the wrong question if you want to answer it. But, but if you believe that the boundary state is not just aware of what makes it out to infinity, but is also knows about the particle inside, mm -hmm. then there is no problem. But then you can say exactly the same thing here. Yes, and, and we do. I mean, we, but then what's the paradox you're trying to resolve? The paradox is to understand not from the boundary standpoint, but from the bulk standpoint. Exactly. How the information comes out. Yes, this is what I said. The paradox is to reconcile local quantum field theory being applicable in the bulk, and yet that seeming to contradict the fact that the boundary is evolving unitarily. That applies here exactly the same way as it applies here. Well, maybe you should finish and we can talk about that during the break. Um, okay. So I, I have, so the, the only remaining thing I have to say is a proposal of where to look for the resolution to this paradox. I don't have the resolution. So the place we should look for the resolution is we should remember why was there a problem in the first place. It was only because we believed in boundary unitarity, which is only true because of diffeomorphism invariance. Now, usually when people discuss this black hole information paradox and the firewall and all of that, they never discuss, almost never, except occasionally a little lip service, the role of diffeomorphism invariance. And I think therefore they're basically missing 
the point. It must be that diffeomorphism invariance, which is at once responsible for boundary unitarity, is also responsible for resolving this apparent contradiction. Now, what does diffeomorphism tell us, invariance tell us about bulk physics? Remember, the reason I had boundary unitarity is that Hamiltonian was an integral over a slice of some constraints plus a boundary term. And these are zero, so it's just a boundary term. And the statement that these are zero in the quantum theory is the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. Let's call it the Wheeler-DeWitt operator acting on the quantum state equals zero. So the whole story wouldn't get off the ground unless we had this condition holding. Otherwise, this term would not be zero in the Hamiltonian. So the resolution of this puzzle must begin with this equation. It's not an afterthought. It's the thought. Okay? And this equation tells us something that there's something extremely non-local about the structure of Hilbert space and quantum gravity. Because what is psi? Psi is a, it's a functional of, say, the three metric on our slice sigma and other fields. And what is this operator? It's a second order functional differential operator. And it's like, an, classically, it would be an elliptic equation. Elliptic equations are non-local equations. The, the kind of, to satisfy an elliptic equation, the, every part of the space communicates with every other part of the space to establish it. A boundary condition, an elliptic equation over here, you change the boundary condition, you change the solution over there. So what this means is that if we imagine that the Hilbert space of quantum gravity starts out as some kind of a tensor product uh, of local factors, like in local quantum field theory. So let's call it HI local. So I'm thinking of this part. I'm going to fix this. Um, like a lattice quantum field theory or something. I have local factors in space. Each one has its Hilbert space. I tensor them all together. I get the Hilbert space of a quantum field theory. That's not what we have. We might start with that kinematically, but then we have to say we're only interested in the subspace of that Hilbert space that satisfies this equation. So now let me project out of that uh, the Wheeler-DeWitt projector. Okay, that's actually the structure of the Hilbert space of quantum gravity. And since it's now no longer just a tensor product, the whole language I was using when I was describing this problem is, strictly speaking, not correct. Like, what language was I using over here? Well, I was thinking I had a local Hilbert space for this quantum and a local one for that, and it's a tensor product of the two, and I defined the von Neumann entropy of the reduced density matrix in the usual way, etc. What this is telling us is that we can't talk about that Hilbert space by itself. It's actually correlated with the rest of the Hilbert space outside. And I don't mean correlated in the sense of the quantum. It's, it's uh, it, putting it differently, uh, this, there is no observable in quantum gravity that talks about just this entanglement of this pair, the way the firewall paper poses it. What you really have to do is form a diffeomorphism invariant observable that describes what you're talking about. But to do that, you know, then you're doing something completely different. You might be jumping in from the boundary, integrating the geodesic equation, locating this by the time on some clock. All the stuff in that observable involves the gravitational field everywhere. And so uh, I'm not saying I know how to start calculating this, but what I'm pointing out is that once you change your viewpoint and say, I'm going to, if you're going to worry about this problem, based on diffeomorphism invariance and boundary unitarity, then you better worry about what is the true context of that theory, which is this uh, diffeomorphism invariant Hilbert space. So that's basically my um, thought about it, the, the non-factorizability of the Hilbert space. 
It's not a little bit of non-locality. It's massively non-local. And yet, at the same time, somehow, for certain purposes, we can forget about all that and just use local quantum field theory at large scales. And so I think what's so interesting about the black hole information paradox, now that I've just you know, accepted that there is a paradox, is to resolve this incredible discrepancy of viewpoints. And it's a discrepancy because there are two very different theories. And here's almost where I think I get closest to the philo philo philosophical issue in, the, in all of this. It's like we have two extremely different theory paradigms, local quantum field theory and quantum gravity, which has a Hilbert space structure that's totally different. And we need to learn how to integrate those two to resolve this paradox. That's it. First part, you think that uh, quasi-normal modes could play a role in calculating entanglement entropy because they are like the fingerprint of the black hole, they are there and they are not arbitrarily given, so they are entangled between outside and inside, maybe also with the quantum <coughs> state of the black Yeah, I guess I would think of them as the, you know, part of the gravitational contribution to that entanglement entropy. Jim York had an old paper that was proposing exactly that we should look to the spectrum of quasi-normal modes to account for the black hole entropy. And I, it seems definitely that it must be part of it, but I don't see why we should imagine that's the whole thing. He got it to within a couple of percent numerically. You mean the area law? Yeah, with the right coefficient. I should look at that again, actually, so that paper. When was it again, this paper? 85, I think. Uh -huh. yeah. I will also look he had a term, the quantum ergosphere, mm -hmm. which he was using to describe those, uh, that contribution. Thank you. Uh, is there any link between the idea that the black holes could be maximalist crumbling and the fact that you were talking about the uh, I don't know, uh, something like a dissipative phenomenon. Oh. I don't think so. Because I think that scrambling property somehow holds already at the semi-classical level. Whereas this, the dissipation I was thinking of would be something quite beyond semi-classical. Um, uh, I found very good this, this, this final discussion that you gave, and I wanted to see whether you, you could, um, uh, whether it can be pushed further in, in, in the following sense. Uh, you pointed out the non-locality of the, of the, the deep non-locality of the linear integration. One possible <coughs> answer could be, yes, <coughs> uh, for we, we know a limit in which the boundary theory gives the uh, the perturbative theory inside of an, over a given geometry. So it's an issue of uh, how far we are from that limit. I mean, if, if uh, the boundary theory has an uh, n going to infinity, uh, so the, the, the physical theory is for finite n, but I know with, when, when it said n going to infinity or h1 to zero in some sense, uh, I can reconstruct the geometry in, inside pretty well. All the way to, all the way to where, all the way to the similarity, or all the way to the to, to a region when some quantum stuff happened. So between the, the uh, sort of common picture that we find uh, in many papers, which is boundary theory, and if if a space time inside with a given causal structure, which is what you say, come on, I mean that doesn't say together. And uh, the, uh, oh my god, is the sum of all possible geometries whatsoever. I mean, we're, we're in the total dark in this quantum gravity nightmare. Uh, there is a, the, the two things can come together by, by building the semi classical geometry as much as possible until 
the singularity or until the quantum region or something happens. So in other words, uh, I think that uh, your picture can still stand with some blobs where, where it goes wrong, where the causal structure cannot be trusted, where the, 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 the quantum gravity uh, becomes uh, uh, important, uh, breaking the, 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 the background geometry seriously. But wait, are you saying that that's um, a necessary component of resolving it? Because in the picture with the resonance, that can be perf that could look quite semi-classical and weakly curved everywhere. I can think that the, uh, the, the, the solution of the puzzle, in, in quotes, can be exactly like your right picture, with the only difference that uh, uh, somewhere the background geometry uh, I mean, the, the, the non-locality should come in in the fact. What is this non-locality? The non-locality, the elliptic equation you're talking about is not an elliptic equation in space-time, it's on the space of the geometries. Mm -hmm. So it's the superposition of geometries that matter. Yeah. Now, people can say, well, superposition of geometry. And a geometry with fluctuations is the same thing. What I'm pointing out is that not, not and I think you would agree, it's not the same thing having a a single geometry with small fluctuation, which is a quantum story, and uh, some superposition of geometries. And the question is, where is the superposition of geometries going to matter? And I, I, I expect that, that it's going to matter where the black hole story... Well, what, what, oh, why do we have the black hole? Shouldn't we simplify this as I'm suggesting and consider that the question without a black hole? Yeah. So then where are you pointing to? I think that they would agree that on the right hand side I can have both things. I can have a, a, a geometry inside and a unitary evolution outside. That's what Gary yeah. would say. And say, that, where, where is the problem? And so the question can be... They could say the so same thing in the black hole. Right? We can. So what we, are you getting at? Have, I don't understand. No, I agree with you. Uh, but you have to finish up the story. Where is the thing that comes out? You, you see the, the Why do you keep pointing me back to the black hole side? I've just explained that we should first resolve the question without the black hole because it contains the essential question. What is the problem? If you want to understand from the bulk standpoint, the right-hand side, you do quantum field theory. And, and you see the quantum field theory. You see the particle in the center. You see the particles going out. Everything's in a pure state at every time. Everything's in a pure state. Everything's consistent using ordinary quantum no, field theory. No, the problem is we can't... Oh. It appears to contradict boundary unitarity. Not if you allow for operators on the boundary corresponding to more well, than but particles. Again, you could say precisely the same thing about the black hole problem. We're going in circles. Do um, you see an analogy, a complete analogy between the two pictures? So you don't see any quantum gravity uh, problem in the second, so you say there is none in the first. Quantum gravity problem? Yeah, there's no sort of quantum gravity problem. In no, the okay, I'm saying sort of the, the opposite. Because there is no strong I think the strong puzzle raised by reconciling the applicability of local quantum field theory in the bulk with boundary unitarity, which is the puzzle of black hole information as, as far as I'm concerned, also occurs in without a black hole. And so it makes a lot of sense to consider it without a black hole and solve it there first. You think there's no solution there? <coughs> Pardon? There's no known solution so far there? Definitely there's no known solution. You think there is or there's not? There is not. You think there's not? I have one paper suggesting a rough idea of a solution. I guess I can, I can tell you that I think um, I have one more thought about the solution that might be worth mentioning. So, like, wh what's the, the biggest consequence of the Willard DeWitt equation? So, maybe the question you're posing is, is this Is an intermediate state the state of the boundary pure or not? That's the question you're asking. Is that right? I'm not asking it. I'm, I'm assuming it is because I believe the evidence from ADS CFT and also from Merrill's boundary unitarity argument. So, it's unitary all the way through. If you consider all the observables, and I'm not claiming I know what those all are, all the observables accessible at the boundary, they evolve unitarily into themselves. I'm taking that as an assumption based on those arguments that I find pretty compelling, at least a provisional assumption. The paradox arises from the apparent contradiction between that assumption and the applicability of local quantum field theory in the bulk. 
But on the right hand side, local fuel theory is applicable on the board. Right, it also is here, around the horizon, which is why we have to introduce a firewall. The horizon is just like any region over here. It's, it's not quantum gravity region. I, I don't think anyone would have proposed a firewall if you had an object with one pair created and one goes in and one goes out. I think the right. problem is that's the amazing ability of black holes to turn otherwise intelligent people's minds to mush. <laughs> <laughs> no, because there's no contradiction with local quantum field theory. I just explained over here there is. No, there's no contradiction with local quantum field theory in that picture. I mean, that's a process that happens all the time in quantum field theory. In fact, you described it in terms of something about atoms. The contradiction is that this quantum has to be entangled with something at the boundary and at the same time entangled with this. That violates the monogamy of entanglement. No, no I don't agree with that. <laughs> you can see why I haven't convinced anybody yet. <laughs> you know, the one comment I thought I should add about what might underlie the resolution to fully appreciate, like, you might think, I think Carlo was getting at a little bit, this could be a very semi-classical picture, a small perturbation of the empty ADS. Well, the, the other one could not. That's what I'm suggesting. But I think, okay, but that I really think there is no, we should resolve the problem here. There has to be something subtle here as well. One subtle thing is, remember the vacuum. That was the thing Bekenstein forgot to think about. Let's think about it again. Once we turn on gravity and implement fully diffeomorphism invariance, the vacuum is a very different thing. Even if the space-time looks very semi-classical, every vacuum fluctuation that we have in quantum field theory is now dressed by its gravitational um, interactions. And so, and it's done in a way somehow described by this Wheeler-DeWitt equation. So there's something extremely non-local, time together, vacuum fluctuations everywhere in the space-time of the gravitational degrees of freedom, as well as the matter that I'm drawing a picture of here. And I think there's some kind of redundancy of encoding of the information so that it is somehow true that we can violate, quote-unquote, the monogamy of entanglement. Of course, we're not going to violate a mathematical theorem about tensor products and so forth. But once we phrase the question in a physically meaningful way, i.e. diffeomorphism invariant way, it will be possible to reconcile the two statements because the information is in more than one place in the state. Can, can I add the word? Let me just read. Uh, the, the firewall argument can be phrase, uh, you correct me, without any reference to infinity, by talking about uh, the entanglement between an early Hawking quanta, a late Hawking quanta, and something inside. Yeah, you can just think of the Hawking quanta kind of like far away, but not at infinity. Right. Yeah, I would say that's not the version I accept. Exactly, so exactly. So you're saying, you're saying, so you're saying um, to do that, you have to assume that there are three Hilbert spaces uh, and the full Hilbert space is a tensor of these three. And no, the will anyway the equation could tell us that this is not the case. Could. Yes, and also it's only the boundary unitarity that I believe exactly. in. Exactly. I don't believe that the Hawking radiation collected somewhere in the space-time have to be pure. That's not what boundary unitarity tells me. Exactly. Look, Gary, let me just point out something sociological that might motivate you to consider doubting your conviction. A lot of people, and extremely smart people, much smarter than me, have worked on it very hard trying to reconcile this and gotten absolutely nowhere. And it's clear that they're missing something really basic. And what I'm proposing is what they're missing. The problem is being formulated incorrectly. Well, but let me just agree with you that I think your comment about the Wheeler-DeWitt 
uh, constraint and, and what it implies about the vacuum of quantum gravity, I think, is very important and is not being taken into account. And the fact that things are more non-local than people have accounted. I, I think that could very well be a key to understanding the, the puzzle. Um, I, I just am still not agreeing that you can capture everything with the diagram on the right that people are worried about. But I think that what you're proposing as a solution could well be important for solving the problem that everyone agrees is a problem. Right. I think in the end the solution would speak for itself. Thank you.